Let's come to scripture. Let's read Psalm 25 this morning. If you've got your Bible with you, uh, please turn to Psalm 25 in your Bible. Uh, if you don't have a Bible or you would prefer to do otherwise, uh, the, the words of this uh, wonderful, lovely Psalm uh, will come up on the screen as well. We continue our series through the Psalms this morning. Uh, by focusing on this Psalm 25. One of the, the writers wrote as I was uh, preparing for this morning that Psalm 25 teaches us wisdom in the context of prayer. Psalm 25 teaches us wisdom in the context of prayer. So let's read this Psalm as we seek the wisdom of the Lord in our lives from day to day. This is the word of the Lord to us this morning. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exult over me. Indeed, none who wait for you shall be put to shame, but they shall be ashamed who are wantingly treacherous. Make me know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love from they have been from, from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth or the transgressions, or my transgressions, sorry. According to your steadfast love, remember me. For the sake of your goodness, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right. He teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. Who is the man who fears the Lord? Him will he instruct in the way that he should choose. His soul shall abide in well-being, and his offspring shall inherit the land. The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he makes known to them his covenant. My eyes are ever towards the Lord, for he will pluck my feet out of the net. O turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. Bring me out of my distresses. Consider my affliction and my trouble and forgive all my sins. Consider how many are my foes and with what violent hatred they hate me. Oh, guard my soul and deliver me. Let me not be put to shame for I take refuge in you. May integrity and uprightness preserve me for I wait for you. Redeem Israel, O oh God, out of all his troubles. We'll end a reading of God's word there. Let's come before the Lord in prayer as we come to his word. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Father God, we do come before you now as we have read your word, as we have read this wonderful psalm, we come seeking you, O Lord. As we have read, or as we have heard, this, this psalm teaches wisdom in the context of prayer. Lord God, as we come to this psalm, we come asking you to make us wise with the infinite wisdom that, that there is in you. Make us wise, O Lord, through your spirit. Make us wise through your word. And Father God, we pray that this morning as we focus on these words of Scripture, that it would be the Spirit of God who would teach us and speak to us and minister these words, not only into our ears and our heads, but right into our hearts, that we may be built up in you, O Lord. Be with us. We ask this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. So as we come to Psalm 25 this morning, I've simply entitled this psalm or this message, uh, A Prayer for Guidance. Because really that's what David, as he uh, writes this psalm, that's, that's what he is looking for from the Lord throughout this whole psalm. And we'll see that theme unfolding right throughout the whole psalm. David is in pursuit of guidance 
And he very wisely understands that the only place that he can go for true guidance is to the Lord. And so he prays. And we've just sung, what a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. There is wisdom, folks, as we live our lives from day to day and, and not treasuring up our troubles in our hearts, but going to God in prayer. Charles Spurgeon has said that true prayer may be, may be described as the soul rising from earth to have fellowship with heaven. The soul rising from earth to have fellowship with heaven. And I think that's what we see in this psalm as David starts. As David starts, he is, he is, he, he's asking God that his soul would rise. His soul would draw near to the very uh, throne of God and to the very God who is on the throne of grace. And so that's an amazing place to start. As we think about this psalm this morning, we'll think about it under three uh, very simple headings. First, we'll see that David expresses his trust as he is in pursuit of guidance. Then we'll see that David's confident confession of faith as he accepts the Lord's guidance. And finally, uh, at the very end, we'll see a, a petition for help, a petition for protection as he seeks the guidance and as he follows the guidance of the Lord. But as I said, we'll start by, by thinking about this, this expression of trust and, and the pursuit of, of guidance through life. I think it's safe to say that almost everyone who exists is in pursuit of some sort of guidance for any number of reasons, maybe all number of reasons. And as I've already said, David starts here by going very wisely to the best place there is to go, to the only place there is to go, to actually receive true guidance. And as David goes at the start of this psalm, he goes declaring his personal trust in God. David humbles himself before God. He admits, God, I don't know everything. Sometimes, Lord, I don't know very much. And so he humbles himself before the one who, who is never stuck for an answer, who never doesn't know everything. He goes and trusts to his Lord and he's drawn into God's presence. And he says that he doesn't want to be put to shame. Now, as David says that, to be put to shame is really the idea in the psalm is, of being put to shame is to, to be Face some sort of public humiliation. Face some sort of public humiliation. And we see this in our world, don't we? You know, the secrets of public figures come out. The deep, dark secrets of their lives, and they are ashamed. They're shamed in the public square because these, these secrets come out. We, we, we live in a world that, that truly understands <clears throat> the saying that the bigger they are, the harder they fall. Because it's a bit of juicy gossip, isn't it? When the, the secret humiliation of a public figure comes to, uh, to the, the, the spotlight, into the spotlight. And we can experience this to a lesser context as well, uh, a lesser uh, extent as well, facing this type of shame, this public humiliation. Imagine you had come into church this morning and you had sat in the chair that you're sitting on and the chair gave way under you. You would feel a little shame. Hopefully nobody would have laughed at you, but you would have felt a little shame. Why? Because that would have happened in public in front of other people. And if, if it happened in your own home and private, it would have been a little bit different. Hopefully that's the worst thing. That shame's the worst thing that would have happened to you if the chair had given underway. But the shame that David asks God asks for God's protection from here is, is much greater than sitting on a chair and not going from underneath you. It's much greater than walking outside and tripping over your laces and falling. And the shame that David is asking God's protection from here is the shame that comes from having publicly hoped. And relied on something that is false. That gives false hope. That gives a false sense of security. 
and that does not have does not give a good foundation when the hard times come really david is coming to the lord and said keep me close to you o lord don't let me be put to shame in the hard times by wandering away from you give me a strong solid basis in you and folks what more could we pray for this morning What more could we uh, look to the Lord for this morning than a solid base, than than a solid foundation for our lives? Think of the parable of the wise and the foolish builders in the New Testament and the the Sermon on the Mount as Jesus shares it. We know the story well, so I'll not read it and we'll not go into it too deeply. But uh, we know that, that, that in this, this parable of the wise and the foolish builders, Jesus says that, that one of the builders builds his house upon the sand. And then the storms and the winds and the waves come and the house has no firm foundation. And the house fails and the house falls. That builder faces shame because he has put his hope and a foundation that does not give stability or security but then we have the wise builder he builds his house upon the rock and the winds come and the winds blow and batter the the house that is built upon the rock but the house is a, a sure and solid foundation and the house stands you know as i was preparing this my mind was going back to when i was a child It's wonderful to teach children things of God. For those things stay with children. Even if they wander off the path, there is still a knowledge of those things there. But when I was a child, I remember very clearly at at a kids club singing the words, don't build your house on a sandy land. I'm sure many of you can quote it. Don't build it too near the shore. Well, it may look kind of nice, but you'll have to build it twice. You'll have to build your house once more. You better build your house upon a rock, make a good foundation on a solid spot. And though the storms may come and go, the peace of God, you will know. David is coming back to the rock that is higher than himself. He's seeking not to be put to shame because he has built his life upon that which lasts. That's what that which gives stability and that which will not fail on God himself. And on his faithfulness. As David continues his prayer then. In verses 4 to 5. He he asks that God would teach him. And and lead him. And just as he knows. That God is the only solid basis. For hope and life. He's seeking that, that God would make known. To him his ways. God's paths. Through life. With all of its twists and turns. I'm sure each and every one of us here have experienced the the twists and the turns of life. The sudden sorrows and sometimes the sudden joys as well. We've experienced the hard times and the good times. David here prays, lead me in your truth. Teach me. For you, I wait. For you, I wait. And this is a powerful example to us of humility, of confidence, and of wisdom. David has the humility here to say to God, and we've already thought about it, Lord, you know better than me. How many times have we spoken to someone who uh, everything we talk to them about, they, they know best. They know better They will not give in to advice. They'll not give in to anyone else's wisdom. David is not like that. He comes to God and he says, you know better than me. You know better than me. He humbles himself before God. He has the confidence that God will faithfully lead him. And he has the confidence to rely on the God who will faithfully lead him. But he also has the wisdom to wait on the Lord. He has the wisdom to wait on the Lord and and not run ahead of God. Not run ahead of God. Sometimes people in seeking God's guidance, as David is doing here, are really doing nothing more than than going to God, than asking God that, that he would affirm what they already want to do. 
It takes humility and trust and confidence and wisdom to stand before the Lord and said, and say, not my will, but your will. And who personifies that wisdom to stand or kneel before the Lord and say, not your will, but my will, or not my will, sorry, but your will, but Jesus Christ himself. Jesus Christ himself. David's final plea in the first section of this psalm and verses six and seven. It's quite a long psalm, so we're just really going to do a whistle stop tour through it. But David's final plea in the first section of this psalm is for love and for mercy in verses six to seven, as I've said. I wonder if you've ever been asked the question, how do you want to be remembered? What legacy do you want to be leave behind? Whether it be in your life as a whole, maybe you're leaving a job and, uh, and someone asks you, how do you want to be remembered within your time within that job? Have you ever been asked that question, how do you want to be remembered? Well, I think as that an a a question is asked, the answer is generally from all people, well, uh, I want to be remembered well. I want to be remembered for the, the good things that I've done. I, want, I don't want to be remembered for that day that I was in a terribly bad mood and snapped at everyone around me. No, I want to be remembered for the, the positive steps that I, I took. I want to be remembered for all the good that I did. You see, it's within our human nature to want to be remembered only according to that, that good that we have done. However, what David understands here in this psalm is that any goodness that is in him, any goodness that he has done is from God. God is his goodness. And so it is through God's own goodness and mercy and love which David wants to be remembered. He says, remember me not according to my sin. Remember me according to your love. Remember me not according to my guilt. Remember me, O Lord, according to your mercy. David understands what Jonathan Edwards, a, a famous evangelist and pastor, would later say. He understands the nature of his sin is that we contribute nothing to our salvation. Except that sin which made it necessary. We have no goodness apart from God. And so David cries and, and we can cry too. We can cry out to God. God, remember me according to your son. Remember me according to the mercy and love and loving kindness that you showed on the cross. Not according to that evil that made the cross necessary. That evil that offended you and offends you. Remember me according to your son. And folks, the reality is that there is only two ways. This, this idea of God remembering is God knowing intimately. And the reality is, folks, that there is only one of two ways that we will be remembered as we stand before God. He will either remember us in his son. Given the, that robe of righteousness of the Savior. Or he will remember us in our sin and judge us accordingly. Folks, if you're still standing in that place where your sin is how God will remember you, how he will view you, how he will see you, how he will judge you. Come to Christ this morning. Come to Christ for forgiveness. Come to Christ for salvation. Come to Christ with your sin, but for forgiveness of that sin. Turn your life over. And like David does. Secondly in this psalm. Confess. A total and complete. Confidence. Confess the faith. Confess your faith in God. And the one who guides. As we move on to verse 8. The, the voice of the psalm. Seems to change. In some ways. 
In verse 8, we, in verse 1 to 7, we have a, a plea to God. Yes, David trusts God, but he's praying to the God he trusts. He's, he, he, he's pleading with God that God would help him in the, the, the uncertain and changeable circumstances of life. But as we move to verse 8, his prayer turns confident because he remembers the one to whom he is praying. The Lord is good and upright, verse 8 says. He instructs sinners. He leads the humble. He pardons great guilt. And folks, we can be confident in our God. In fact, might I be so bold to say this morning that the only confidence we can have in this life is in God. Confidence in anything else is a is a false confidence. The only confidence we can have in this life is the confidence in the God who does not change. The reason we're not put to shame is because of the confession that we make that Jesus Christ is Lord. Have you said that Jesus Christ is Lord? Have you confessed that? Have you admitted that? Do you believe that? If you have admitted it and confessed it. Do you believe it every day of your life that Jesus Christ is Lord? Do I? As I ask these questions, I ask them to myself as well. The psalm, it gives the basis for confident Christian hope in the face of life's uncertainty and changeability. And that is, if you cast your eye down to verse 14, the Lord's friendship. The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him the psalm writer david writes elsewhere in scripture a writer has written that the friendship of the world is enmity with god you see what david is saying and what the one of the the themes of scripture is that uh, is that apart from god there is no steady rock to anchor us in life apart from god there is no lighthouse to guide us safely through the perils Apart from God, there is no harbor where we can find safety and calm in the face of raging storms. David's confident faith is grounded in in the friendship of the Lord. We thought much about it as we studied Abraham. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness and he was called the friend of God. This word friendship that the psalm includes in verse 14, the the word friendship uh, means really counsel. And the idea behind the friendship of the Lord being for those who, who, who fear him is that God guides with wisdom those who give him due honor in their lives. God guides with wisdom those who give him due honor in their lives. We all desire good friends, don't we? You know, bad friends are easy to stay away from. Good friends, though, fill us with joy and with uh, peace at times as well, as we uh, glean their wisdom and their, uh, their, their friendship simply. We all desire good friends, friends whom we can trust, friends who we can rely upon. You know, friends who lift the phone at three o'clock in the morning when we're going through something terribly difficult. These are the type of friends we want. These are the type of friends that we need. And David is saying that there is no better friend than God himself. Good and upright is he, as the Lord, verse 8 says. That is, that David is admitting and confessing in faith that God is perfect in wisdom and power. God is perfect in mercy and love. I could go on and on and on, but let me summarize by saying that David understands and we must seek to realize as well that God is completely perfect in totality. There is no darkness in the God who is light. He is full of mercy and kindness and truth for those who love him. He is full of grace and gives grace upon grace to those who will trust in him and folks for us this morning what better source of is there to get wise counsel from than the true source of true wisdom power mercy and love himself 
Proverbs 13 verse 20 says, whoever walks with the wise becomes wise. It's a, a principle that, uh, that says that if you surround yourself with wisdom, it's more likely that that wisdom will rub off on you. And David is saying here that there is no better wisdom to surround yourself with as you seek guidance, as we seek guidance, as I seek guidance in this life. There is no better wisdom to surround ourselves with than the wisdom that comes and the wise counsel that comes in the friendship of God. In the friendship of God. The wisdom of the Lord is running off, rubbing off on David here. As he seeks guidance. As he confesses his sin. As he seeks not to vindicate himself. But that the Lord would vindicate him. In the presence of his enemies. But the question for us this morning. Is not primarily how the wisdom of God. Rubbed off on David. It's how will the wisdom of God. Rub off on us. How will God guide us wisely through this life and its uncertainty and its changeability? Well, when Zara and I, when we used to go on holidays, we used to, before the times of, 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 of ready internet and your phone where you could just look something up, we used to go and, and seek out the local tourist information. And we used to go to the local uh, tourist information and the place that we would be. And, and there we would go to find instruction as to what we could do whilst we were in that area. We'd look for all the touristy things to do. Sometimes when we'd be at the tourist information, we might even get a map showing us the right direction to go to the, uh, the tourist attractions. The tourist attractions. Folks, God has given us his wise counsel, his wise instruction, his wise direction to us as we are tourists in this strange and startling word. And it's right here. We begun this morning by reading those great words, rejoice always, pray without ceasing and give thanks in all circumstances. Why? Why? Because that's the will of God for us. That's the will of God for us. That's the wise counsel of God as we are tourists in this, as I said, strange and startling word. World, sorry. But as God has given us his word, he's also given us a tour guide. Because he's given us his spirit also. Folks, God doesn't hand us over to trust in the wisdom of the world. He doesn't hand us over to trust in any wisdom that we can muster up within ourselves. God has given us his wise guidance as to how we can live. But folks, it is up to us to imbibe it, to read it, to understand it. And to live our lives by it. How will, the, will, how will uh, the wisdom of God rub off on us? Well, the wisdom of God rubs off on us whenever we acknowledge him as God first. And then when we order our whole lives according to his word with the help of his spirit. One hymn writer wrote all to Jesus, I surrender all to him, I freely give. This is one of the wisest things we can do in life, folks. Is hand ourselves over into the care of our God in completeness and wholeness. The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him. David writes here, that is those who, who give him the highest place of honor. For he is our highest good. But one of the other Proverbs says this. There is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. And you see, the thing that we must realize is that the friendship of God is not some highfalutin idea that's out there somewhere that we simply have to believe. No. God sent his son to this earth. He sent his son to this earth to be our friend who sticks closer than a brother. 
And so we sung the words of the hymn before we uh, came to this part of the service, before the, we came to the sermon. What a friend we have in Jesus. The second verse there says, can we find a friend so faithful? Absolutely. Can we find a friend so faithful who will be there to listen to our troubles and our strifes at one or two or three o'clock in the morning or 12 o'clock in the afternoon or as we drive in the car to a hard meeting or as we drive home from a difficult meeting, not knowing which way to turn. Or as we drive home from a morgue or as we drive home from the hospital. Can we find a friend so faithful? Who will all our sorrows share? Yes. Yes. Jesus, let it, Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. David is confident to go to his Lord for wisdom and for guidance in the face of an uncertain and changeable world. And finally, and very quickly, as time passes, we've seen David's expression of trust. We've seen David's confession of confidence. But as we come to the final verses from verse 15 to, to, uh, to uh, 22 of this psalm, we see God, uh, David's prayer for God's, that God's guidance would protect, his petition for protection as he seeks to follow the guidance of God. David says, and I, I will go through this quite quickly, as I say, as my eyes in verse 15 are ever towards the Lord. In verse 20, he prays, guard my soul. And again, in verse 20, he says, I will wait for you. 21, sorry. David says these things in the, the final portion of this psalm. And really what the Holy Spirit is teaching us is that there is only one source of guidance to whom we should be looking in this life. There's only one source of wisdom, true wisdom. There's only one source of protection on whom we are to wait. Folks, this world holds many snares for us. When it comes to to the search for guidance. I said at the right at the very start, everyone is looking for some sort of guidance in some way, for some reason, to go along some path. And this world is not short of seeking to provide guidance to many people. How often do we see advertisements for fortune tellers? How often do we see advertisements for Spirit mediums? How often do we see advertisements uh, for other ungodly ways that people, in which people seek guidance? Folks, let us never be tempted to take our eyes off the Lord. Let us never be tempted to remove our gaze from the one who knows the beginning from the end. Let us never take our gaze off the one who loves us and cares for us and keeps us and protects us. Let us never look to the world for the wisdom that the world can provide. Let us look to God. Maybe you've given up reading your Bible recently. Maybe it's become taking a back seat in life. Folks, come back this morning. Come back today to reading, your, reading the Word of God. Maybe you've taken your eyes off the Lord and placed it in something else for, for hope. Well, can I say again the whole point of this psalm that David is praying for is that he may not be put to shame. And folks, if we take our eyes off the Lord and gaze at anything else, we are setting ourselves on a path where shame will come. Let us look to the Lord. Let us cast our eyes back to the one who saves us on Calvary. Let us cast our eyes back to the cross where love and mercy was shown. 
Let us ask God to protect us in this changing and uncertain uh, world and the changing and uncertain circumstances of life, trusting that, that he would keep us on the right path and believing that there is no safer place to be than in the refuge of his loving mercy. Let me read some words as we come to a close from John Newton. I read these during the week and I thought they were very helpful for us as we thought on this idea of guidance and protection and reliance upon God. John Newton, the writer of the hymn Amazing Grace, said these words late on in his life, having lived a life of worldliness. Some of you know his story. This is what he says. I rely with humble confidence upon the Lord Jesus Christ, God and man as the only foundation whereupon a sinner can build his hope. Trusting that he will guard and guide me through the uncertain remainder of my life and that he will then admit me into his presence and his heavenly kingdom. Let us rely on our God. Let us build upon the foundation which God has given to us in faith. The remainder of this life is uncertain for each and every one of us. In different ways. Life can take strange turns and twists. Life can be cut short. The remainder of this life is uncertain. We don't know what tomorrow holds. I have a plan in place for tomorrow for, for what I'm going to do. I could die tonight. This life is so uncertain. We don't know what tomorrow holds. But we know the one who holds tomorrow. And we can know his strong grip holding us too. Let's turn to him for his protection, for his guidance and for his wisdom in this uncertain life. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you this morning for Psalm 25. We thank you for the words that we have read, the words that we have studied. We thank you for your servants who have been down through the, the history of the world, been able to give wise guidance and counsel. But Father God, we thank you for your spirit this morning. The one who lives with us to guide us through this life. Father, help us to develop a deeper love for your word. Help us to rely more and more upon uh, you through your word. And Father, help us never to forsake in the search of guidance. Let us never forsake the rock that is higher than we are and the word that he has given to us. We thank you, O Lord. We thank you for your guidance. We thank you for your protection. We thank you for your forgiveness. And we pray that our worship would be worshipped truly and spirit and in truth. For you, O Lord, are the way, the truth and the life. We love you. We commit the rest of our time together to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.